Republicans in the House, and yet we see a pretty heavy travel schedule uh, by the president in this month, in September, mostly focusing on some of those red states that we were talking about in the last segment. Check that out. I'm told he is going to go to North Dakota, South Dakota, Missouri, Mississippi, Montana, Nevada, and Tennessee all in the month of September. Our White House reporters, what does that say to you? Well, and he's also doing that in addition to having to spend a few days in New York for the UN uh, General uh -huh. Assembly. So he's packing in trips. And I think the White House really views his ability to influence these elections as critical. I mean, and you see that in his tweeting, you see that in his travel schedule. They believe, and he has shown, that if he gets active, if he gets out there, he will energize the base that will come and help him preserve that, that majority that he sense, wants to keep. And my sense, Abby, is, I don't know if you're hearing this too, is that he wants to get out and be with these oh, candidates yeah. as much, maybe even in, not more than <laughs> the candidates want his help. Absolutely. It, my sense is that the president is the one who believes that his political power is perhaps more potent than it might actually be but he can do some really important things I mean check where he's going just this week he's targeting some red state Democrats trying to potentially flip some seats or at least make it harder for Democrats to hold on to them he's also raising money so these are kind of critical things that he really can do he can raise money that Republicans are going to need in order to fight the battles in the places that he simply can't go but the president has been talking about the red wave no one thinks there's going to be a red wave except for perhaps the president. And uh, the extent to which he is being realistic about that or is just trying to change the narrative, it's unclear. But uh, there's a really big distinction between the president's views on this red wave thing and what Republicans actually think is going to happen. And, and the ultimate question, too, is at what point does he view and the Republican leadership both sides ultimately view is that the Senate ultimately becomes the firewall to mm -hmm. keep the Senate because the House is looking more dire almost by the day. You talk to most Republicans around town, they, know, they believe that it's a very small chance of them keeping the House at this point. The map is just so daunting, it looks worse by the day. The Senate's map is still very favorable to the Republicans, but in a, in a Democratic wave, you never know what happens to the Senate, so at what point do they really hone in to try to keep those sentences. And I have, a, I have a key example of the point that you just made, which is such an important one, Manu. Uh, Tennessee, it's a vacated Republican seat. Bob Corker is retiring. Marsha Blackburn wants to fill it. And the ad that she's running in Red Red Tennessee, probably not surprisingly, wraps her arms around the president. I'm Marsha Blackburn, and I approve this message. Bill Bredesen was recruited by Schumer to run for the Senate. Bredesen donated a lot of money to Hillary Clinton. Phil, whatever the hell his name is, this guy will 100% vote against us every single time. Now that's happening in, in Tennessee. And as you answer this, David, I want to put up uh, one other example that's maybe less of a sure thing. In Virginia, which is a purple state, uh, Corey Stewart, the Republican candidate for Senate there, is putting up tweets uh, showing how much the president supports him. Yeah, look, Manu makes a great point about how uh, people in Washington are looking at this midterm election. A lot of lobby shops around town are starting to interview Democrats, preparing for Democratic chairman in the House. But it really, this midterm election is so fascinating because it's a tale of two campaigns. On the Senate side, Republicans have so many pickup opportunities because the map is so starkly different. And that ad for Marshall, Marshall Blackburn that you showed is not desperation. It is smart politics. Now, mm -hmm. Phil Bredesen is a very formidable Democrat. I kind of think of him as a unicorn candidate because he's so well-liked in Tennessee, which has become mm -hmm. so Republican, even though he's a Democrat. But the best thing Marshall Blackburn could do to win this race is to tell everybody, look, at the end of the day, he's a vote for Schumer and the Democrats, and I am with President Trump. And so that's why you're seeing the president's schedule taking him to these red states. He's even going now in October to help Senator Ted Cruz, who's found himself in a big heap of trouble because they're thinking of turning out all of those voters in the exurbs and, and rural Texas to help him deal with his problems in the suburbs. And, and so there's a lot the president can do, even while at the same time that the party is in so much trouble in the House. And one more example, you mentioned the House, uh, of a House Republican who is just, you know, twisting herself into a pretzel trying to, you know, get away from, from the president. Barbara Comstock, Republican from Northern Virginia, not too far from here, in a statement, our public servants have been getting short-term 
shortchange for years. We cannot balance the budget on the backs of our federal, federal employees, and I will work with my House and Senate colleagues to keep the pay increase in our appropriations measures that we vote on in September, a slap at the president for freezing federal pay increases. Yeah, I mean, those suburbs, I mean, Barbara Comstock is a classic example of a suburban district that is not a good place for the president to even be heard of or from. And uh, this issue of federal worker pay has been an interesting show of how this White House works. They announced that they're, 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 they oppose the pay increase only to find out from some vulnerable Republicans, namely in Virginia, where there are a ton of federal employees. So that may not be a great idea. The president then says later, oh, I might think about changing it. But it just goes to show the president needs to do no harm, including to some of these people uh, like Barbara Comstock and even uh, Corey Stewart in Virginia, who just need him to not do any harm, especially with suburban voters, and let them run their races. So well said. All right, everybody stand by, because up next on this Labor Day, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders are making their cases to unions. They're pushed to woo the sexual orientation. When we stand together, we win. When they divide us up, they win. Our job is to stand together, to have the courage to take on the greed of the billionaire class and Trump and his friends. And former Vice President Joe Biden spent his morning at a parade with labor workers and their families, reminding all of us about one of his historically favorite campaign lines, that he's just a scrappy kid from Scranton. But he was quick to say that the Pittsburgh pit stop doesn't mean Biden 2020 is a sure thing. Talk about what this means in terms of your political future here. Is this an oh, it doesn't mean anything in my political future. I've been with these guys my whole life. And my grandfather Finnegan Scranton said, Joe, you're labor from belt buckle to shoot soul, man. I go anywhere with these guys. These are the guys that brung me to the dance, as they say. Belt buckle to shoe soul, Rebecca Berg. You are joining us live from Pittsburgh. And you asked the former vice president about an important topic for labor unions these days. What happened? That's right, Dana. Well, Joe Biden is now again speaking right behind me. We're at the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers here in Pittsburgh a few hours after the parade that he marched in. The third time in four years that Joe Biden has marched in the Labor Day parade here in Pittsburgh. Uh, but we asked him about NAFTA and about the president's trade policy. Obviously, this was such a crucial issue in the 2016 election, and Joe Biden has been one of the loudest Democratic voices saying his party needs to better engage on these types of issues with voters. Take a listen to what he had to say. Mr. Vice President, do you support renegotiating NAFTA? No. Uh, there's a, we, can, we always can renegotiate everything we have to make it better, but not, uh, not the way he's going about this. Where do you differ from the president on trade policy? You don't have enough time. <laughs> So not drawing uh, a firm stance on trade, Dana, but certainly uh, drawing uh, a contrast with the president on trade. Now, one of the other questions Joe Biden was getting along the parade route today is what is going to happen in 2020? Are you going to run? Lots of workers and supporters urging him to run against President Trump in 2020. He was noncommittal. Of course, uh, but he did say if he runs for president, he will be here in Pennsylvania a lot. Jenna, you can bet. Rebecca, thank you so much for that uh, for that report. Appreciate it. And you know, let's talk about Joe Biden for a second. Um, look, it, it is it is no secret that he's wanted to be president. He's run, and as the president has frankly rightly said, when he has had run his own campaigns, they haven't gone so well. But since then, he was vice president for eight years and established a different kind of relationship with Democratic voters. Yeah, that's right. And the question is, does he pull the trigger? You talk to Democrats, they're split about whether or not he ultimately decides to do it. I think he probably is also split about whether this is the right time, he's the right candidate. I think this presidential campaign is going to happen very quickly. It's going to take off soon after the midterms this November. You start to hear candidate after candidate making their intentions very clear that they are going to do it or they're seriously thinking about it. And this is going to be just a huge Democratic field. It's going to be wide open, no clear front runner. 
Biden may be considered the most well-known name, but he may not end up being the nominee if he were to choose to run because this is such an unwieldy, unpredictable field. And the base wants someone who's going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against this president, resist him at all costs. And the question is, is Biden that person or is anybody else in this field? Yeah. And it's just too early to tell. One of the 734 other people. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. You have to think, though, a little bit after this last week where he gave that very emotional and, and uh, forceful tribute to John McCain that people may have looked at that Democrats and said hey Vice President Joe Biden could stand up to pr President Trump pretty well. Yeah, well, he sure could. Let's talk about the, the broader issue on this Labor Day of unions and of Democratic, um, the Democratic base and, and getting working voters out to the polls again. Uh, first, I want to show you what the president.